Hey guys, welcome back to our study of imperialism. This is uh, chapter 10, section 2. This section is all about the Spanish-American War. And uh, we're talking here about the American expansion and, you know, why would the United States get interested in a, in a war between two, a country and its colonies? Um, well, it's all about imperialism. So let's go ahead and get started with some objectives. We're going to talk about how a lot of American opinions favored uh, supporting Cuba against Spain. Uh, that's how the war starts, a Cuban revolt against, uh, against the colonies, or the colonies in Cuba, against the, uh, the owners of the colony, Spain. Uh, we'll identify why the United States got involved in some specific events, and then uh, the results of that war. Background information on Spain. By the end of the 19th century, um, well, before, Spain was at one time the most powerful nation in the world, one of the greatest uh, navies in the world. Uh, but by the end of the 1800s, that's the 19th century, um, it retained just a few of its colonies worldwide, Philippines, Guam, um, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and uh, a few in Africa. Uh, the one we're going to be talking about is the Cuban colonies revolt against Spain. And as a result of this Spanish-American War, it eventually becomes Spanish-American War, um, Spain le loses even more of its uh, uh, colonies. So let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Um, our United States interest in Cuba started all the way back in 1854, about the same time that we were interested in opening up Japan for trade for the, with the United States. Um, we also moved east and looked at some colonies uh, in Cuba to trade with Spain and Cuba, mainly for sugar, like Hawaii. We were interested in Cuban sugar and, and setting up some plantations there, American-owned plantations. Uh, we attempted to purchase that from Spain. Spain refused. Um, the rebellion, the first rebellion, starts in Cuba in 1868. Now, that rebellion lasted for 10 years. Um, extremely unsuccessful. I mean, how do you fight for 10 years and nothing happens? Literally nothing happened. Well, a few years later, Spain did uh, eliminate slavery, but that's, that's after the, uh, the, the, the war is over. That's after the rebe rebellion had ended for 10 years. What's that say about Spain's military? They can't put down a rebellion. It takes them 10 years to put down a rebellion from slaves. I don't, it, yeah, there, that just kind of goes to show uh, the power that they were falling or losing, uh, how weak they had become. Um, following that first rebellion, American capitalists, uh, American businessmen, sugar growers, go into Cuba and do establish um, some businesses in Cuba. And, and we do have, after 1878, we do have American owned sugar plantations in Cuba. Very important when it comes to the second rebellion. <clears throat> Go back, sorry, sugar plantations. All right, Second Rebellion takes place, and this is where we start to see a war, and this is when the United States gets involved. Jose Marti, very important name, person you want to remember. Um, he is actually exiled from Cuba after the first rebellion. He starts the second rebellion from his uh, temporary home in New York City. And he starts writing pamphlets about the treatment of the Cubans and how bad Spain is. And he tries to get American sympathizers to side with him uh, and give money to support the, the rebels on uh, the island of Cuba. Uh, 1895, as we see the second re rebellion beginning, and his work does uh, prove successful. He gets a lot of American sympathizers uh, to go with him. In fact, the American public opinion was, was split as before America really wanted to have nothing to do with it. Um, some wanted to protect Spain, excuse me, wanted to support Spain because of the American sugar growers' um, plantations on the, on the islands. We, a lot of Americans wanted to support Spain to protect those American investments. Remember, that's one aspect of imperialism is that you protect your American investments, you protect your investments uh, on foreign countries. While other Americans, the other half of the Americans, uh, supported Cuba. So it's, you know, they saw the Cubans fight for uh, freedom, very uh, similar to the United States Patriots during the Revolutionary War and the war against England. And the call goes out, Cuba Libre, free Cuba. <clears throat> um, the Second Rebellion proved to be a little bit more violent than the first. Um, to at, Finally, at one point, Spain begins to round up Cubans on the island and place them in concentration camps. Uh, we hear of concentration camps mainly when we start talking about World War II and, and Hitler and the Jewish concentration camps over in Auschwitz and Poland, Germany. 
Um, the concentration camps in Cuba were just as bad, but no one talks about them because this was a four-month war. The Spanish-American War lasted for only four months, but the atrocities and the, the conditions in these Spanish concentration camps where Cubans were held were, were just as bad. 300,000 uh, Cubans were at one time filling the camps. Uh, United States headlines in the newspapers talk about these uh, conditions. Um, two newspapers, New York World, New York Journal, get involved in this, and we see this growing sensational style of writing called yellow journalism, and uh, we're, we may do a project on that um, later on in this unit, but yellow journalism is where you take a story and you sensationalize it, you blow it up to the point where you're not necessarily telling falsehoods, you're not lying, but you're stretching and exaggerating the truth so much that the only point is to sell papers. So. Uh, the most famous one we'll get to in just a second one is a famous quote from William Randolph Hearst. He sent some uh, journalists down to Cuba just to see, to get some first-hand stories, first-hand accounts of what's going on, and we'll see that on the next slide. But the two newspapers, again, New York Journal, New York World, they were writing these sensational stories for the sole purpose of making money, for selling papers. It's called yellow journalism. Uh, we see this in the in grocery stores today. If you uh, go through a checkout counter, you'll see tabloids like... Uh, not necessarily people, but the National Enquirer and Star magazines, and they just blow these stories out of proportion. Again, not, not telling lies, but stretching the truth beyond belief. Again, yellow journalism. Um, Hearst, uh, from the New York, I believe the New York Journal, Hearst is quoted as saying, you furnish the pictures and I'll furnish the war. We'll watch a little video in class that specifically talks about this. Essentially, he sends his journalists to Cuba and says, go go talk to the Cubans, go talk to the, the rebel fighters, and, and let's get some stories, you know, let's make money. His journalist gets down to Cuba, and there's nothing going on. People are going about their daily lives. Shops are opening up for business. People are going to the sh markets for, you know, their needs. And he says, there there is no war. That's the that's the report that's sent back to Hearst. Well, Hearst says, you just, you just give me some pictures. You draw some pictures. We'll make sure this war happens. You furnish the pictures, and I'll furnish the war. Is the famous quote. Now, some historians say that, you know, maybe he didn't say that or he didn't say it exactly like that. Essentially, though, it's the stories in the newspaper that fan the flames for war for Americans. That's, uh, and that's, that's very important when we get into another major aspect of this war. <clears throat> Again, McKinley, elected in 1896, becomes president in 1897. Remember when McKinley becomes president? He annexes the island of Hawaii, so I'll give you a little timeline here to think about. Enrique de Lome was a Spanish ambassador in the United States. Uh, we have this set up today with all of our allies, and even, I guess, even some non-allied countries. We have ambassadors, people we send from our country to their country. And it's, it's a way to keep open communications between the two countries. Well, Enrique de Lome was the ambassador from Spain in the United States and it was his job to relay news back to the the Spanish king and uh, the government there and just to let them know how things were progressing with communications with the United States you know will the United States go to war with us over this Cuban rebellion Enrique de Lome wrote a letter to the government of Spain and in that letter he called McKinley a weak man McKinley will only do what the public uh, supports. He will not go against public opinion. So if the public wants to go to war, McKinley will go to war. Well, at the time, a majority of Americans did not want to get involved in a, an all-out war. And so he, and Enrique de Lome says, McKinley's weak. The, the, the American people do not want war, therefore we will not have war. Unfortunately for de Lome in Spain, that letter was uh, intercepted. Um, there was some suspicion of spying going on, so all Spanish mail was intercepted and opened before it was sent on to its destination, and uh, that letter was printed in the paper. And that letter turns the American opinion completely in favor of going to war. And DeLone was right. McKinley would only do what the public opinion uh, supported, and now that this letter is out, the American public opinion supports war, so McKinley favors going to war. So there you are, Spain, you did it to yourself. <clears throat> uh, the USS Maine, one of the nine new ships that was built uh, in, in, uh, as part of this growing uh, military force. Again, part of uh, imperialism is expanding your military force. Um, 
The ship is sent to Cuba to, pair, to protect American lives and investments. Should the rebellion in Cuba uh, get out of control and the American people not have uh, any safe place to go to, they would be able to leave shore and stay on the ship until things calm down. The ship blows up in the harbor and instantly the New York World and the, uh, the New York Journal publish sensational stories about how the Spanish planted a bomb, um, how there was sabotage on the ship, uh, so many American lives, 260 Americans die in this uh, terrorist attack, if, if you will. Um, Dan Hurst of the New York, I think New York Journal, puts out a $50,000 reward for the Spaniards responsible for the, the nasty terrorists who blew up our ship, who was there on a peaceful mission just to keep American lives safe. So as with this act, the USS Maine that the United States gets involved <clears throat> because of that, um, without any investigation of what's going on or without waiting for the results of the investigation uh, of why the ship blew up, McKinley asked Congress for uh, a declaration of war. April 20th, Congress declares war on Spain. Spain says, oh yeah, well we declared war on you two days ago. And, and then Congress comes back and says, well, ours is reciprocal, meaning it, whenever you say you declared war, we declared war one day earlier, whatever. It was just a playground standoff. Um, but the United States does go to war. Uh, we start in the Philippines. Commodore George Dewey is in charge of the Pacific Fleet. He sails his vessels into Manila Bay on the islands of Philippines, and within six hours he has control of the port in Manila. Um, I think one American casualty, maybe. I don't even know if it was that many. Um, essentially, though, after this battle at Manila Bay, we destroy the Spanish American, or we destroy the Spanish fleet in the Pacific Ocean. It's completely gone. Now, remember, we're using our new steel hauled battleships. Spain still has the wooden battleships, maybe an iron clad or two, but mainly it was all wooden battleships for Spain. Um, in the Philippines, Spain surrenders again six hours later. And with that, the United States gets control of the Philippines. We'll get into that in Section 3, how the United States deals with the Philippines and the new territories. All right, on to the mainland of uh, Cuba, war in the Caribbean. We send uh, another, another part of our fleet to Cuba to, uh, to blockade, essentially blockade Cuba to prevent any Spanish ship from coming in and any Spanish ship from leaving. Um, Santiago Bay is the, another major naval battle uh, in, against Spain. Again, the American Navy is superior. On land, one of the most famous battles is the Battle of San Juan Hill and the Rough Riders, the, the famous infantry charge of the Rough Riders. Now, the Rough Riders was not an infantry group. It was led by Teddy Roosevelt and Leonard Wood. Actually, it was led by Leonard Wood with Teddy Roosevelt as the assistant. Some of you may know the name Leonard Wood, uh, as in Fort Leonard Wood, just up the road in Rolla, or just past Rolla in Waynesville. Um, the Rough Riders was a cavalry unit. They were made up of volunteers. Cavalry means you ride horses in the battle. The Rough Riders went across the Caribbean without their horses. The, the horses weren't ready yet. They, they hadn't reached the dock or whatever, but the ship that was carrying the men had to go. So they were waiting on their horses. All throughout the war, they didn't have their horses. There was no cavalry. It was all foot soldiers. So um, that's one fallacy that... Uh, that this war brings about, that these stories in the New York Journal, New York World sensationalize. The Rough Riders uh, do fight on Kettle Hill, to one, a battle right before San Juan Hill. They charge up the hill um, and are beaten back. They are saved, their lives are saved by an all-black infantry unit. But that's not published in the papers because that doesn't sell news, that doesn't, sell, that doesn't make money. They are beaten up so badly that they do not participate in San Juan Hill, and uh, but that doesn't sell papers either. So the New York Journal, New York World, published these sensational stories: how Teddy Roosevelt leads the men up the hill with his saber outstretched, charging up the hill, taking out you know 5,000 men all in one big swipe. You know those nasty, sensational stories. Um, but anyhow, none of that happened. But if you tell the truth, you're not going to make a lot of money. So they have to sensationalize these acts. As a result, uh, Teddy Roosevelt gains enormous popularity, and he rides that popularity into the 
presidential office. Uh, again, the Spanish fleet is destroyed. The United States Navy does its job. It keeps the Spanish ships in. Any Spanish ship that attempts to flee is destroyed, and uh, they essentially give up. They they ask they surrender. Um, also, as a result, or shortly after the invasion on in Santiago Santiago Bay, the United States in, invades Puerto Rico, where they see no resistance at all. They are welcomed with open arms by the Puerto Ricans. The end of the war, Treaty of Paris, signed August 12, 1898. When did this war begin? Uh, let's go back. Just be patient with me. I just want to show you something here real quick. Get to the main. There we go. 1898. I want to say it's uh, April. I'm not real sure, but I think it's April. Anyhow... There we go. April 11th, 1898. When does the war end? August 12th, 1898. Formally, December 10th. So, April, May, June, July, August. What, four or five months? It's a five-month war. And we destroyed the Spanish American, or the Spanish fleet in the Pacific Ocean. We destroyed the Spanish fleet in the Atlantic Ocean. And we take four of the five colonies that Spain owned. Uh, kind of gives you an idea of how good our uh, Navy had become with these new steel hulled ships and also how poor the Spanish military was. They were ready to give up. A lot of the Spanish soldiers on Cuba were ready to go home. They didn't want to stay there anymore. They were tired of everything. They just wanted to go home. So they gave up pretty easily. As a result of the treaty, Cuba is free. The United States acquires Guam, Puerto Rico and a few other islands and we buy the Philippines for twenty million dollars again there's some issues that arise with the Philippines we'll get into that in section three Puerto Rico is still part of the United States it's actually uh, a territory of the United States but in, uh, they have luxuries of citizenship but they are not United States or it's not they are citizens but they are not an official state there's a vote every year that gets turned down the Puerto Rican people don't want to become a 51st state because they have to pay taxes some debate uh, goes on over whether or not the United States had a right to sign the treaty as they had. Um, this idea of imperialism becomes a major issue in in the American in the American public circles among you know water cooler talks, if you will. Um, McKinley is quoted as saying, "Well, there's nothing left to do but to educate the Filipinos, uplift and Christianize them again. That Anglo-Saxon superiority that the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants were superior to any other race." The idea that drove Americans manifest destiny is used to justify imperialism. Uh, the ironic thing about McKinley's statement about Christianizing these savages in the Philippines, the Philippines have been Christian for centuries. Uh, they've been Catholic under Spanish rule for centuries. Uh, Catholics are Christians. So it just kind of shows you the, uh, <clears throat> the arrogance and the ignorance of, of some American leaders at the time. Um, some felt that the treaty violated our own Declaration of Independence. How can we free someone and then pay to control them? We paid $20 million to control the islands. Again, that gets into another major issue. Uh, leads to essentially the Philippine-American War. Booker T. Washington, we talked about him in Chapter uh, 8, Section 3. Um, claims that the United States has its own problems at home. Why should we be taking on further racial issues, You know, tackling another race, the Philippine? Uh, islands uh, when we can't solve our own issues at home. And then union leaders like Samuel Gompers uh, fears that these new Filipinos will be given citizenship status and that would be another race of people coming in uh, similar to the Chinese. You know, we talked about how the Chinese were feared and hated because they were taking American jobs. Well, now that we have acquired the islands, does that mean the Philippines will come in and take jobs as well? I mean, we already passed the Chinese Exclusion Act and we thought the problem was over. Now we've just bought an island full of people. Are we going to allow them to come in and do the same thing? You know, so the union leaders are uh, totally opposed to this as well. We call people like Booker T. Washington, Samuel Gompers, anti-imperialists. There are others involved in anti-imperialism. Andrew Carnegie is an anti-imperialist. Jane Addams, anti-imperialist for various reasons, economic, social, different reasons. Uh, there's, again, the treaty is formally approved by the United States Senate in 1899. Okay.
I believe that's it. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. We'll talk more about this in class. Talk to you later.